Come on now, people. I've been telling you for almost two years now, you need to have a GNR TV. And now sports are back. Football is back. Now is the perfect time for you to get this if you don't have it already. And if you look on over here, as I've been telling you before, you get all these amazing channels, every single one of them, for $20 a month for two devices. And if you look on up over here, it's written. It's written everything you get with GNR TV. If you want four devices, $40. And there's some cool extras right here. GNR TV, streaming done right. If you don't have it, get it. What more can I say? What more can I say? It's time to cut the damn cord, stop being ripped off by the dish and cable, and get this lovely thing we call GNR TV. Streaming done right. Let's get slicing and dicing with Sir Sturdy Horror fans. On this podcast, you will hear me and a guest do some movie reviews, random funny horror chats, and whatever else comes to mind. So tune in, kick back, relax, and always remember, I'll see you in your nightmares. Well, this station's mask. How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of Horror Research 30. Today I have the great Jack O'Halloran. Jack, how are you doing? I'm very well, thanks. Doing the best I can, whatever to let me get away with. <laughs> it's a good answer. I'm glad to hear that. And we were just talking, and I want to just jump right into what we were discussing at first, which is you started out, you used to be a professional boxer, which I think is just Well, I actually awful. started playing, bo- playing football. Oh, really? Yeah, I actually, uh, it was at a time when I got out, when I was in school, there were no hardship cases. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't play pro ball until your class graduated, which I still think they should have it that way, but that's why they have so many injuries. Guys are just too young. But, you know, you had to wait. So they had, they had like a farm system. The Jets grabbed me right away, Eubank, and uh, they, they had a farm system where we played in a team. A team was out of Philadelphia, actually, at Tinicum. Uh, Dick Christie, his brother Jimmy played there. Mm-hmm. A, lot of, a lot of guys that went into the pros played in it until they could go and play pro ball. So we played a pretty high level of, of football. And uh, when it was time for me to go and play, I um, Philly had a great team, Jurgensen, McDonald, and a lot of friends of mine down there, and I – and they, they were just bought by a guy, Jerry Wallman. And I said to you back, I, I want to go down and play in Philly. And he said, yeah. He said, well, you always have a home here. So when I went down there and I watched it, they hired this guy, Joe Kuharik, who traded a championship football team away in four months. Wow. And I just uh, said, you know, take this team and stick it. And Timmy Brown said, trade me while you're at it. And Muhammad Ali had just won the title. And I said to some friends of mine in Philly, I can beat that guy. And they thought that was a good idea. And next thing I know, I'm in the gymnasium and embarked on a boxing career that I could never box amateur because I was already considered a pro. So we went right into the pros. And I started uh, six months later, I had my first pro fight. Bob's your uncle. That's awesome. That's awesome. And now, speaking of Ali, which you did tell me, but just for the listeners... How'd you guys get along? I know you said you met him. You guys- he was, you know, I'll tell you something. He was one of, the, I don't know if you, have you ever met him? I never got the chance to one meet him. One of the nicest guys, one-on-one, uh, an unbelievable individual. Smart. He knew what he was doing. He was a great athlete. He'd have been a great athlete in any sport he did. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was just, he was a great athlete. And, and he was a super guy and he could fight. And he, you know, he was, uh, and we got on really well. And in fact, I'll give you a funny story. I was California heavyweight champion in, in San Diego, and I got a phone call from him. <clears throat> he was with a friend of mine from Vegas, Jim Gene Kilroy, who was always around him. And uh, he called me on the phone. He said, you got to do me a favor. I said, yeah, I'll do you a favor. I said, sign a contract to fight. He said, no, we'll do that. We're going to do that. And I said, yeah, well, you know, he said, you're fighting my brother, Rockman. You got to get him out of boxing, man. He's embarrassing. Are you kidding me? He said, no. Got to get him out of boxing. So I 
I said, well, we, so I was fighting him that week. I said, oh, my God, I better go in the gym a couple of days. And uh, so I had a fight with Rockman. I knocked him out in the ninth round. He never fought again. Wow. And um, Muhammad and I, <laughs> he was supposed, we had a deal all put together. We had a guy that owned the Coliseum in San Diego. He was a, he was a Canadian kid who just bought the place. And we gave 40% of things to Ali. And he, he thought the deal was great. But Kenny Norton was owned by two millionaires, multi-millionaires. Mm -hmm. And they put some cash in the basket and went up to Chicago and gave it to Herbert Muhammad. And all of a sudden, uh, Kenny was fighting uh, Ali and Ali called me on the phone. He was crying. He said, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but uh, I don't have any control over it. And this is what they did. and This is what I have to do. And I said, fine, you know, we'll, we'll find another day. So we went back and forth and it was, we were going to fight in Australia when he fought Bugner and, and then I beat a kid, Alvin Blue Lewis, who was number two in the world. He had just went 13 rounds with Ali. And he came home and he beat Terrell and he beat another guy. And they, they made a fight with me, thinking they were getting him ready to fight Ali again. And I gave him a terrible beat. And then I, you know, I beat him in Detroit. And I went up to Ali's camp and I said, okay, now I'm just buying this clown out. So what do we say, you and me? <laughs> and he said to me, if I give you a fight, he said, are you really going to try and beat me? I said, let me tell you something, pal. For the very first time in my career, I'm going to go away to camp. And I'm going to do like you guys do. I'm going to spend eight weeks training religiously. Mm -hmm. And when you come in that ring, you better bring a gun. And he said, two stakes, please. <laughs> so we, we, we had a lot of fun here. And I. He, was, uh, he, was, he, was, he was a great guy. I, I liked him a lot. Yeah, that's awesome hearing hearing stories about him because I mean, all I did was hear stories about him as far as watching, you know, watching his fights online or just watching what he did just for people in general. And my father, he's never met him, but he, you know, he's an Ali fan, and uh, this stuff that he would tell me about Ali and just how great he was as a boxer, how intelligent he was, just that alone, I'm just like, it's crazy, it's crazy, and it's like looking back at him and just listening to how he spoke how intelligent he was and then watching him in the ring. Cause he was like, a, he was a boxer, but he was like a pretty boy boxer. You know what I mean? Like a ladies man, but he could fight. He, he could actually, he really could fight. And yeah, he, uh, fight. you know, it's like when he fought Foreman, he, he and I had a conversation cause I had fought Foreman. He said, Jack, tell me about Foreman. I said, I really think he gets tired. I said, I think he's got sickles, man. Sickle cell. I said, so he said, yeah. Okay. So he, he he loosened the ropes and shit down there. Did that rope a dope? What they call the rope a dope? Yeah. And and the first four rounds, Foreman was banging and, and and Ali was just laying on the ropes and he was leaning way back. So Foreman had to really stretch himself to reach him. And he was doing haymakers. And every time he Ali catch the punch on his on his arm and he whispered in Foreman's ear, "Man, my old lady hits harder than you." <laughs> and you're getting them mad. So every time a heavyweight swings all the with all their might, and they pull back, you know, you got it takes a lot out of you. So the punch that Ali knocked him out within the seventh round, if he'd hit him with that punch in the set in the second round, he probably would have hardly hurt him. Because George had a pretty good chin. Yeah, but he but um, tired. You no, know, he just he got tired, mm -hmm. and uh, and Muhammad beat him, and he but they they. He did that. I mean, Angelo Dundee, nobody knew that he did that. He would not loosen the ropes. Or not. So he, when he leaned back, he was leaning back just those couple inches, mean a lot, you know, to have that much give way. And he was, so he was clever. He was, he was nobody's fool. Trust me. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's, that's, that's so cool though. It's talk to somebody that's actually met Ali and that was actually. Well, you know, it's like when he fought Liston and they all, it, what they, no one ever tells the truth of the matter is that, you know, Charlie, Charlie was a gorilla of a fighter, and they were supposed to fight, and then Muhammad had a hernia, so they called the fight off. And then they got it together, and they went up to Toronto to fight, and uh, <clears throat> Liston and I had the same manager. And his wife, the, Sam Margolis, his manager, his wife had a brain tumor, so he was the only one Liston ever listened to. And he was spending time with his wife in the hospital and stuff. And Charlie never went to camp. After the first fight was canceled, he stopped training. 
He took his wife to camp, all kinds of crazy, because Liston was nuts. He was a little bit off on his own world. And when he fought Ali the second time, uh, he um, he hit him a shot. I mean, he, Muhammad Ali was 220 pounds, and he could punch with speed. And when you have a guy ducking under you and coming up, and he's coming down with a punch, and he hit him square on the chin when he hit him. Mm-hmm. And so people say it was a mystery punch. It wasn't no mystery punch. He caught him a great shot, and he put him out. You know, and the, the first time they had fought, when Liston sat on a stool, was because Ali cut him. And what people didn't know about Liston was he couldn't stand to see his own blood. Oh. You know, I've seen him blow a fight in, in Vegas with uh, Leotis Martin. Leotis Martin was hitting him, and, and he, his nose started hemorrhaging, and he was swallowing his own blood in the ninth round. The Otis hit him a shot. And the Otis was, was a pretty good fighter. But Liston laid down. I was sitting right at ringside. He laid down right in front of me, picked his head up and put it on his glove and looked at me and winked. <laughs> I said, you bum. You're not getting up. <laughs> he stayed down. He couldn't stand to see his own blood. Some guys have different quirks, you know. Yeah. Every athlete has a different zip about him. So now after boxing, is that when you decided to go into acting? Like yeah, that- in 19. So, you know, they st- it started when I was I was fighting. I only had about a dozen fights, and I was undefeated up in Boston. And, uh, I was living in Boston, fighting out of Boston, and Steve McQueen came and did the Thomas Crown Affair there. And, um, and we took care of him when he came into town. And he and I became really good friends, and he said, you know, man, you know, you should come down on a set. He said, I'll get you a SAG card. And, she come back to Hollywood. We're going to have a great time. He was a real super guy. And I said, nah, you know, I, I'll pass. You can't do that. He said, don't be crazy. We'll, we'll, you'll be great. What the hell do you want to get punched around the ring for? He said, oh, come in the movie business. So yeah. I, I, I turned him down. And then in 1969, I knocked out a guy who was number two in the world, Manuel Ramos, in L.A. And they came to me to do The Great White Hope with James Earl Jones which was the biggest movie in Hollywood at that time. And I was supposed to just go in and sign a contract. And I uh, just knocked this guy out. I'm looking at another title shot. And they wanted me to go to Spain for six months. And I said, I don't think so. And the guy said, what are you crazy? I thought you were all, the deal was all set. But some people from friends of mine from the East Coast had made the deal that I would just do the picture. They wanted to get me off the streets. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, so I, I just I fudged on that when I got out of it. And, and I, uh, when I retired, they offered me Farewell, My Lovely with Robert Mitchum. And uh, I said, you know what? I think it's time. So they flew me out to California to do a screen test, and Mitchum saw that. And he said, it's either him or I don't do the movie. So I blame it all on Robert Mitchum. <laughs> you know? It's all Mitchum's fault. He's... Um, he was a great individual. He was, a, he was a, if you ever had to have a mentor in your life, have one like Mitchum and you things are pretty good for you. That's good. That's good. So how do you, did you, do you, do you enjoy acting? Like, okay. I'm I, you know, I, it's a natural thing for me. I, I love it. And the timing comes from sports, you know, yeah. and, and acting is a funny business. The camera either loves you or it doesn't. One, you know, you can't, there's certain things about acting that they can't teach you. It's a presence that you have. Either you have that presence or you don't. Mm-hmm. A lot of people go through great acting careers, but you, they, they, you you go to a movie and you'll see a guy do a part. And and he may be a very good actor, but you'll be walking out saying, boy, he was so good. What was that guy's name? They just don't, but if you see Brando doing something, no matter what the role is, you're walking out of the, boy, wasn't Marlon great when he did this or wasn't he great when he did that? And certain people had, had a presence about them. And, uh, you know, that's part, part of the game. It's it's a interesting, interesting business. That's good. That's good. Now, do you enjoy it as much as you enjoyed boxing and playing football, or is it kind of just a different type of love? It's a different kind of deal. You know, it's uh, it's very – it's very satisfying. I, I, I was very capable of picking and choosing the things I wanted to do. 
I've made a few mistakes by not doing a few things I should have done. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's part of the game. It, uh, but I've had a very successful career at it and did some really stalwart pictures and the Superman franchise made us icons. Uh, but every picture I think I did was very well done. I mean, Farewell, My Love is a great movie. King Kong was a good movie. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a great picture with Jimmy, Jimmy Coburn and Omar Sharif, the Baltimore Bullet, which didn't get a lot of, they didn't have the money to promote it probably, but it was, it was a great pool hustle. We, we shot the, actually shot the nine ball tournament at, at MGM that year. And uh, that was a good movie. Hero in the Terror with Chuck Norris was a good movie. Uh, and Dragnet was great. Dragnet with Danny Aykroyd and Tommy Hanks. Uh, we had a we had a ball doing that. That's awesome. So I, you know, I, I had some. I had a lot of fun. That's good. And though. I'm still doing it. You know, so that's good. What do you have coming up? Or if you can discuss. I got a script I wrote years ago called. Uh, it was a, there was a movie done back in the 30s called The Informer with Victor McLaughlin and John Ford directed it. It won four Oscars and. We took the book and did another adaption of the book, and uh, we're getting ready to do that. And I've got uh, a book that I wrote called Family Legacy, which uh, is taking the world by storm because we're telling the truth about a lot of things. My father was a pretty infamous man out of New York, Albert Anastasia, and he ran a little company called Murder Incorporated, and he was partners with Charlie Luciana and Meyer Lansky and Frank Costello. And, oh. And – uh so they, you know, we're we're going to tell the truth about how they were thrown under the bus and what really happened in to the changes in America, you know. And in the very beginning, what people don't realize is that back in 1900, when when the all the migrations were coming together, uh, all the illicit monies that these guys did, they were partners with the government, industry, organized crime, and unions were all partners. Mm -hmm. They all watched out for each other, and they took a lot of their illicit monies and created a lot of jobs in the growth of the country. And my father ran all the waterfronts and all kind of jobs there, construction companies, and they invested in uh, General Electric and Westinghouse and insurance companies, and you know, so they no one ever tells that story though. You know, it's yeah. always about what kind of hoodlum activity was done, and they take liberties, Hollywood. You know, they just did this picture called uh, The Irishman, which kind of makes me laugh because Frank Sheeran I knew quite well, and I knew Russell Buffalino very well. And Sheeran never killed Hoffa, and he never killed Joey Gallo. That's Hollywood's, you know. So we're going to tell the truth about several things. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So we're doing a mini series, which will turn into a series. And I have one book out there. There's three more books coming. Then we have another book, uh, The uh, Life of uh, Lucky Luciano, and uh, that's going to interface with what we're doing. So, we've got uh, quite a bit of material. We're going to have, have a good time with it. And then we're building a studio in Nevada, which will be the biggest studio in the history of the business. We're putting a four million square foot studio together. So, the industry will move actually over to Nevada, which is something that should have been done 30 years ago. To put everything involving the entertainment world under one roof. Mm -hmm. and to build a smart city right next to it so people only have 15 minutes to go to work instead of hours. Like, I live in Redondo Beach, and if I'm going to do a picture of Warner Brothers, I got a two-hour each-way traffic jump, you know? Mm -hmm. Or if I go to Paramount, even, it's like uh, 45 minutes. So it, 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 if you're universal, you're another two hours. So, you know, it's just it, to, to be able to have – and technicians live even further outside of L.A. because it's cheaper living – but they had to travel all the way in to go to work every day. Yeah. And back home again. So to make it to where they only have to go 15 minutes, it's like cost effective across the board for everybody. So it's, it's a good deal. We're, we're really chomping at the bit. If it wasn't for this Mickey Mouse virus stuff that's going on, we'd have been at it already the last couple of months. So we're just ready to jump into the saddle. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Now, I guess we can jump into. <laughs> I know you were in Superman, Superman Two. How was that? How was it working with um Christopher Reeves? Which I did read that you weren't you you weren't a huge fan of his, but you did pay pay your respects as far as. Well, uh, you, you know, you you gotta understand something. 
when you work with people for four years, you become like a family. You know what I mean? Yeah. And everybody has arguments and misunderstandings. And Christopher was young. It was the first big movie he ever did. And he should thank D Richard Donner every single day, boy, because Donner got a performance out of him that there'll never be another Superman, Clark Kent, like Chris Reeve. Mm -hmm. He did the role to the letter. I mean, Richard Donner got a tremendous performance out of him. But the problem was he walked around like Superman all the time. And he went to a restaurant, friends of mine, and said some things he shouldn't have said. And he and I had an understanding about it. And then he came out, we came out of a room, and all of a sudden he, he thought he was Superman. You can't talk to me that way and all that. I said, what? What are you? What? He started acting like he. So I put him against a wall. And I was just getting ready. And Richard Donner whispered in my ear, Jack, not in the face. Don't hit him in the face. And I laughed like you're laughing now. And I dropped him on the floor. And I said, you know what, kid? You just got the greatest pass of your life. And and we talked. And, you know, we, we weren't close friends. But, you know, you, you always got a friendship going because you're you're like a family when you work like that. Yeah. And we worked a lot of hours. I mean, we set a lot of precedents with Superman. There was a lot of technical precedents that we set. They had, uh, and it took long, tedious hours. We were shooting what they call Vista Vision, and it was shooting, shooting on Vista Vision. Like we had a big 70 foot screen. Oh, wow. And pole arms coming out of it. And we laid in body molds 70 feet above the ground. Wow. And. They shot us into the picture. Like, all when you see the scenes, the fight scene and all, and flying around buildings and under bridges, and people said, wow, man, how'd you do that with wires? We didn't have wires. We did this this division on this division, which took a long time to do. It was, it was tedious, but it was worth it, you know? Yeah. We broke a lot of – I mean, even today, Superman, because there's no CGI now, so it looks so much better than a lot of stuff they're doing even today. Yeah, it's like I, a classic movie. It's never, you know, people go and see little kids go and see it today, and they, wow, man, you know, I got, and still, I, I go to comic cons and stuff, and I remember the first comic con I ever went to, and people come up to me and they say, "Wow, you really can talk." <laughs> yeah, because your character was me, and you you chose to do that, right? Yeah, because you know you had. Yeah, Terrence was a vicious general. Sarah was a man-eater. Somebody had to reflect to the children in, in the audience because there was a lot of kids in that. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, so I played this big brutish guy like a, like a child, learning how to work his eyes and stuff. And, 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 I, and I always said if I got a chance to do a mute part, I would embrace it because Jackie Gleason was a friend of mine, and he did a picture called Gigo. They won an Oscar for playing a deaf, dumb mute, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it just, it gave me the, yeah. So we, and I thought it worked out pretty well, actually. That's awesome. Do you like playing the villain role? In certain pictures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, here in the terror was, was a trippy picture. I mean, I, my, my, <laughs> my ex-wife was, she was from England and she was down on the set watching me go to work and, and I walked up up a ramp as me and turned around and came back down as this character. And she said, my God, you scared me so much. I don't know if I can sleep with you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. It, yeah, it's cool. That's really cool. Because you seem like, from just from me talking, you seem like such a nice guy. But I, like you're, this right here, you look like a, a brute villain. Like you could just, you don't play games. You know, well, I, I don't play games and I never did it in the street. You know what I mean? I a, yeah. Yeah. I was, I was a handy, uh, handy guy. But, uh, you know, acting is a lot of fun, man. You know, Mitchum taught me real simple, you know, just take the character and embrace it and do it. Just walk down the street like the character you're doing. He said, you know, just, uh, don't get caught acting. Mm. And, I, and it was the greatest advice he ever gave me. He was, he was, he, the guy was amazing. It was a trip. A lot of fun working with him. Now, are you into horror at all? Like horror movies or are you a fan of that? <sighs> some of them aren't bad. You know, there's some of them are pretty good. And, and I've got a partner that we're going to do some films with, uh, Jennifer James. 
who's into that. She's got some pretty good horror pictures. And I'm going to do one of them for her oh, nice. and play a recurring actor um, called River Run. It's a quite an interesting story. It's a, and and they're horror, horror pictures that they do for, you know, a million dollars or so. And mm -hmm. But they do well. I mean, they're, some of them aren't too shabby, you know. Some of them, I think, are a little off the wall, but, you know, it's, just, uh, it's like anything else. People either yeah. do things properly or they don't, you know. No, I agree. I agree. Some of them are nuts, but as a fan, for me, speaking for myself, as a fan of that genre, I love it. I love it. Well, you you, you most like, uh, what's his name, uh, Freddy Krueger. I do, but I'm more of a Jason Voorhees fan. Have you ever, have you ever met Freddy? Have you ever met the guy that plays Freddy Krueger? Robert Ingram. I met him one yeah. time, actually, about Robert Ingram. two <laughs> years ago. Two years he's, ago. He's really a nice guy, actually. He yeah, really he is a nice guy. He's a nice guy. I've, I've met him, and then I met quite a few people that played Jason. Like, I met quite a few of those guys. All nice guys. Yeah, most uh, yeah, most of those guys that I've ever met were all pretty pretty good guys. But, you know, it's, um, but they, some of those movies do quite well, and some don't. Some do. Yeah. You know? I'll say a lot. As far as my my uh opinion on well not even opinion i guess you can say it's kind of a fact too is like the eight i feel like the 80s one did so good because a lot of them are like cult classics now you know what i mean well you know they were done better because actors were different okay you know back in the in that era there was you, you even the old time actors were such a pleasure to work with because they were very professional mm -hmm. you know and it, uh the industry's changed quite a bit it's, it's yeah. not, and, you know, not. The, the old horror movies were, I mean, Boris Karloff and, uh, and and guys, the Cheney, Cheney was a super guy. God, I liked him a lot. You know, he, he played uh, in all the Frankenstein movies of Wolfman and, uh, and, and Boris was, Boris was, Boris was a hell of an actor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of the English actor, what's his name, Christopher, uh, Oh God, my brain just went dead. There's, but there's some some of those guys that played those horror roles did it so well. Vincent Price, you know, Boris Karloff. Boris Karloff was just he could scare the pants off you. Right? But he was such a nice guy. If you ever met him off set, you'd say, "How's this guy ever do that stuff?" You know? <laughs> that, that's what I say about like the the horror people that I've met. You know, that I've watched movies growing up watching them. One, you never think you're, well, for me, I never thought I'd meet him. And then two, it's like, wow, I, in this movie, I've seen you rip somebody's head off, but you're one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. Like, they're so, <laughs> it, it's, it's cool how, which I know it's a movie, I know it's make-believe, and you know, but it, I think it's still cool how people can kind of turn that, turn that on and off as far as like, okay, I'm in actor mode, I have to be this menacing character. Even when like, you do like a photo op with them. Yeah. I like how a lot of them, I've only done a few, a handful, well, two or three photo ops, I think. But I like how they stay in character for the photo op, even. Like, just that whole time when they're in their, you know, when they're in their costume. Yeah, 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 yeah. They yeah. stay in character at these cons, and it's it's just awesome for us. Me as a fan, the other fans, we love that kind of stuff. And then, you know, they're, when they're out of character, they're just the nicest people in the world. I'm just like, this well, they did awesome. that series, uh, Dark, uh, Dark Shadows. Hmm? Uh, do, you, do you remember Dark Shadows? I didn't. I don't think I've seen that one. Dark Shadows. Oh my God! If you've never seen that, you should go get it and look at it. Check it out. Oh, it was brilliant. Well, well done. I mean, well, well done. It was. It was. It was kind of really cool. But some of those, you know, what? What's your favorite horror movie? That's tough. That's tough because I don't really. I have like as far as like icons, like a slasher type. My favorite is Jason. But as far as like a horror movie, I don't really have a favorite. I'm more of like whatever I'm in the mood to watch. I can tell you like some of the some of the ones that I feel like are some of the all time greats. I'll say like uh, the thing from '82, and I'll say Jaws, the original Jaws. Those are like two that come to mind right off the bat. Just that I thought they were so well done the way they were done. Very well done, right? And yeah. all pra like I, what I love too again from the '80s era, and you can say even the '70s era is all practical effects. Like there was no CGI back then to, you know, to do things like there's yeah. 
Well, they 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 overdo it today. It, it, it was too much, too much CGI. You know, like we're great. we're getting ready. We, we we've got a project we're putting together. You know, we're waiting for some the, the Warner Brother deal to settle down because with hologram, the holograms were amazing technology, mm -hmm. and I can bring Christopher Reeve back on the screen with a hologram and, and the three villains, and we. We've got an amazing storyline, and I think we're going to pull that off in the next year. And it's going to be uh, – I mean, if people ever saw Christopher come back, it would blow their minds away. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And go back to the way Superman was done originally, the old American way. You understand? Mm -hmm. People have to understand, Superman was the first American superhero. Yeah. So, you know, when they started doing these darker versions – of Superman killing people and stuff like that. That's, that's not really Superman. So we want to go back and we got to, we have a tremendous storyline. Oh God, I can't wait to, we'll see, you know, that's cool. We got a lot of the pieces around it that so we may be able to pull it off. No, that's cool though. And you seem very excited and it's cool that you're still working, like still acting. You didn't stop. And you still seem like you really have a passion for it. Like when you first started, you still have that passion and that drive for it, which is well, you know, it's 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 a lot of fun, you know, being able to do what you want to do and uh, and portraying certain characters in a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of fun to that, you know. And that's why Superman that it, it worked out so well because I had this character so believable. And people, people used to come up to me and say, my God, you scared to death out of me, but I loved your character, man. Because they related to like a young, young kids, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's, it'll be interesting. I definitely got to look at more, watch more of your work now and just check out all your different roles you've done. Man, if you ever saw Farewell, you should watch it. It's a great, great film. actually. Very, very good. I mean, great cast. Yeah. Harry Dean Stanton, you know, John Ireland, Charlotte Rampling, Anthony Zerby. My God, there's, there's a host of – and Mitchum's just – Mitchum. Mitchum's, Mitchum's yeah. incredible. That's good. We had a lot of fun doing it. That's good. And I keep seeing this picture of you on top of the car when it comes back around fighting Superman. <laughs> <laughs> I got to ask about, like, how, how was that scene? It was, you know – we we had we had uh, we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun doing you know uh, doing things and you know just and I did all my own stunts. So I said you know just let's you can't hurt me. I mean I had seventy six pro fights to play a little football. With. There ain't no way you're gonna ever hurt me. So if I can't get away from something, shame on me. You know. Yeah, I was just about to ask you if that your sports background if that helped you with your stunts, which I'm sure it did. Oh, absolutely. No, absolutely. It, uh, in, in several pictures, it, it really did. And, and, and it makes it so much more authentic, you know, mm -hmm. when you're doing something. And, you know, people not cut from this and cut from that. It's yeah. right there and take the scene right through. And stuff. So it, that's, that's cool. That's really cool, though. Like, Because I know it takes a lot. It's a lot different to do. You're acting in the movie, then to go and do your own stunt, whether it's taking a fall, taking a punch, whatever the case may be, and not having a stunt double come in and take that fall or take that punch. Well, it's, it's much better when they can see your face and you personally yeah. doing something. You know, it makes, the, it makes it that much more real, you know? It's like we did, we were doing Superman, and I had to walk through the Daily Planet and go through the wall, you know? Mm -hmm. And <laughs> the, the prop guy, had they, they cut out certain deals and, you know, so you walk through it and you're supposed to have this jack that exploded to explode the wall. Well, the jack didn't work. Hmm. It worked after I already went through the wall. Then it hit me in the arm and I never flinched. I just kept going through the whole set. And, and the guy, the prop guy got scared. He started running off, running off the set because he thought I was going to come after him. Because it, and, and this scene worked exactly beautiful. You ever see when I walk right through the Daily Planet? Mm -hmm. the wall and stuff, you know? And we did that in, like, real time, you know? So it, it, certain things certain things you do, it just make the film so much better. 
Yeah, yeah. That, no, that's that's. I like that though. I like that. And again, like I said, I like how you're still into it. You're still acting. You still enjoy it. You still have that strong passion for it. And I just can't wait to see what else you have coming up. I, I'm excited for it. Yeah, we got some pretty neat stuff. You you're gonna like it. Trust me. I, I can't. But fair, the, my book, Family Legacy, is very well. It's a great book. If you've never read it, get a chance. It's it's a it's a great read. Family it Legacy. Tells, huh? Is that Family Legacy? Family Legacy. If you go to familylegacythenovel.com, it tells you the whole story right there, and the book's there, and it's uh, and it's a story about from my father's death to Kennedy's death, and I tell the truth about the Kennedy assassination. Oh wow! I'm gonna have to look yeah. at. I'm gonna have to check that book out. No, it's pretty cool. It's not too shabby for first time out. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check that out. Well, I guess we can kind of end the show and wrap up. If there's anything else you want to discuss or promote. I'm good. Feel free. You need, you know, I'm cool. And again, I greatly appreciate you coming on. I had a great time. This is my pleasure. I hope your audience enjoys it. They better. <laughs> <laughs> and you actually. <laughs> He's a professional boxer, guys. So, yeah, you better let this go. But, yeah, really, it was really nice chatting with you. Thank you again for coming on. Down the road, once you get once you get your new stuff out, too, I would like to have you on again to sit down and talk. Yeah, for you. sure. We'll do it. We will. We'll do it. Anytime. But, you call me anytime you want. Awesome. Awesome. Greatly appreciated. Enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the and rest you, of your day. Take care of yourself. And yeah, don't stay out of harm's way. I'll try. <laughs> you, yeah. do, you do the same. Have a good one. Yeah. That was an awesome episode, ladies and gentlemen. Jack, thank you again. I had a great time. Peace out, guys. <laughs>